We're joined today by Coindesk research analyst, George Kaloudis. We're diving deep today here to discuss two reports that George has worked on. First, the quarterly report for the third quarter overview of what's happening in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. And second, to talk about George's report about the Lightning Network. George, welcome to Real Vision. Thanks, Ash. Thanks for having me. So, George, let's get started. Let's dive right in. Let's walk through the 3Q report, the big overview that you've recently worked on for Coindesk Research. Yeah, so I'd say on a big overview, whenever we write these reports, the two things we really focus the most on is the two big blue chip assets, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And my co-author, Teddy, who uh, is, you know, behind the scenes actually doing writing today while I'm here speaking about it, he focused on the Ethereum and DeFi stuff. And I focus mostly on the Bitcoin and more of the, the market structure types of things. So the big theme that we saw from Q3 was the fact that we were in what we like to call the scalability summer, right? Everyone was talking about scaling either Bitcoin or scaling Ethereum. Bitcoin because, oh my God, how am I going to send money to someone and buy coffee if I have to wait an hour for my blocks to confirm? And for Ethereum, everyone started buying NFTs and say, well, I don't want to spend $400 on gas fees just so I can buy a picture of a penguin. Uh, so those two things sort of were in the ethos of what everyone was talking about. And it was actually kind of an interesting quarter from our perspective because it felt as if nothing happened from a price perspective. But if we remember, we started the quarter much lower than we actually ended it. So Bitcoin ended up 25% and Ethereum was up about 32%, which is, if you actually sit down and think about it, it feels like we were trading within this band for such a long time that it's almost shocking to us that when we look back at the quarter, it's like, oh yeah, that's right. July wasn't uh, so great from a price perspective. Yeah, and absolutely massive, obviously, when you compare it uh, to any traditional asset class right now, for example, U.S., equities. So what were the main trends you saw? Let's walk through some of this research. Yeah. So if we just think from a market perspective, so I, I, I spoke about price. So on page four, we have what I think you're referring to, where we have the S&P gold and bonds basically going flat to down and Bitcoin and Ethereum well above that. Uh, that, of course, comes with volatility. So on page five, we have a volatility chart that shows you know, volatility is up in the 100% level for Ethereum and a little bit lower for Bitcoin. But if you compare that to previous quarters, it was relatively muted, which is surprising, right? And you get, you say relatively muted, it's 100% versus, you know, like a 10% for like bonds and S&P. Uh, from the most interesting thing that I think we saw from that, though, was Bitcoin broke out of its correlations to the big macro assets. Bitcoin was is typically touted as something that's this big, non-correlated, permissionless, can't be messed with any by anybody type of asset. But there have been times in the past year or so where Bitcoin does show some level of correlation to gold, some level of correlation to the S and P five hundred, sometimes even an actual negative correlation to the U S dollar. But in the past quarter in Q three, so we have this on page six of our report. Bitcoin stayed within that non or uncorrelated band the entire quarter, minus there's a little blip at the end, but basically the entire quarter, which is crazy and kind of awesome, right? We th try to think about these new investable assets within the frameworks that we already understand. And Bitcoin is doing this thing where it's acting as a risk on asset for some people, a risk off asset for, for another set of people. And for some people, it's a risk everything asset. I would say that my, me, myself, I say it's a risk off asset and a risk on asset because I, ha I see an asymmetrical bet in making a lot of money in the future, but also I can go up against, you know, the money printer. Yeah, there you have it. Exactly. As you said, the correlation to gold, obviously decreasing over the last 18 months, correlation to S&P 500 rising. Yeah, so we see that divergence happen actually pretty clearly, it seemed like, in, in Q3. Now, I would say that it's still not outside that band. It's not actually correlated and not actually negatively correlated to gold. But that happening might suggest that people are starting to view this as more of a, a risk-on asset, something that you would put like, okay, we have our safe haven assets here, but we want to grow our wealth using you know, the S&P, using Bitcoin. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I wonder if the institutions that are coming in are the ones that view this as more of a risk on asset. Although I would say the institutions that have played in now probably view it more as a risk off asset because these are the people that are very convicted. You know, the Bill Millers of the world, the Sandy Junker Millers of the world. 
Yeah, and obviously, as discussions of inflation continue, uh, that is very much a conversation we're probably going to continue to have. By the way, we should say that, Ben, it looks like plus minus 25% correlation. Yeah, so beyond price performance, some of the, the important things that happened during the quarter was in the Bitcoin world, we had, uh, so on page 12, we outlined what happened to Bitcoin hash rate. And it wasn't necessarily what happened in Q3, but more of what happened in Q2 and Q3. So in Q2, everyone remembers China had this big crackdown on Bitcoin mining and the hash rate, which the amount of computational power used to process transactions dropped precipitously during the quarter. And we entered into Q3 thinking, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? And we actually had a huge hash rate recovery. Now, uh, I think it grew about 45%. And that suggests that miners either relocated outside of China to another location, or it was turned, oh, they were all turned back on just because of a lack of enforcement by the, the Chinese government. And given sort of the past two weeks where China has come back and said, hey, we actually did ban crypto, we actually did ban Bitcoin mining, there's uh, probably a, a likelihood that the former is what happened, that people moved outside of China. And the coolest part, I think, about all of that is that the hash rate and the miners are what hold up the infrastructure of the, of the whole entire Bitcoin network. And they were relocated successfully without any uh, downtime. And that's, imagine replacing half of your network and moving it elsewhere without having you know, any downtime. You see our social media platforms go down where, when they're not even moving things elsewhere. So it sounds like you think that this is a very bullish sign, the idea that you can, it truly is decentralized and that you can effectively replace these uh, hash pools elsewhere. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. And it's actually been one of the biggest criticisms people who aren't in the space have to say, you know, Bitcoin is a China coin. 45% of, or at the time, prior to the uh, the crackdowns, it was about 66%, two thirds of all the mining power was in China. And there are many reasons for that. But now that it's moved outside and there there are these preeminent other countries coming out and saying, hey, we'll support Bitcoin mining. There's even talks about Texas becoming sort of this hotbed for Bitcoin mining. I think that's bullish, not because it's going outside of China and coming to the US, but because it's going out of China and going to, going everywhere. No, it might be going to Kazakhstan, which although there is this this layer of, okay, it goes to Kazakhstan, it's still going to be coal powered, right? Do we want to have a decarbonized future or do we want do we not care? It's it's bullish because it's moving out of China and, and leaving just one geographical presence. Yeah, and able to be rescaled elsewhere. Again, an important point. George, as we look at this chart, we see two different types of hash rates here, obviously very closely correlated based on the data series. But tell us the distinction between pool reported hash rate and calculated hash rate. Yeah, so we have the way that hash rate is calculated is, is the darker purple that we have on the chart. Uh, that's a calculation that is done in real time looking at the what's called the difficulty measure, which is just how difficult it is for a miner to find a Bitcoin block. And it looks back over the past two weeks, which is what the difficulty period usually is. And it says, okay, we should have gotten this many blocks, but we got this many blocks. So if you get more or less blocks, depending on what the calculation spits out, it's gonna spit out a number that's an estimation of what the real time hash rate was at that, that time. And, but to that, we have what's called pool reported hash rate. and you know, we know who these pools are. We basically know where all the hash rate is coming from. And those pools want to be very uh, transparent with how much they are mining and providing to the system. So they'll report through APIs through a website and say, hey, this is how much we have uh, online. And from that, you can kind of have a more real time measure. And it's good to look at both uh, just to know, say, okay, you're saying, you know, Ant Pool can say whatever they want about what their hash rate is. But if it's, you know, too high, they're going to, overestimate what they say. And that's sort of a, this is like a check against it. But at times in Q2, when the uh, China crackdown happened, it was good to look at the mining pools because it was actually interesting to see that the Chinese mining pools are the ones who had the big drawdowns. You couldn't tell from that by just looking at the calculated hash rate. So it's good to look at both. It, neither is necessarily more correct to look at, but uh, it just depends. Take them in concert and look at them both. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.